let you take it away. Okay. I don't know if I'm as talented as, as Scott, so I'm not going to walk around with the microphone. Or if I do, be very kind if I look like an idiot while I walk around with the microphone. Um, so I'm going to talk about architecting personalization today. This is me, in case you forget what I look like. Um, <laughs> my name is Laura Christensen, and I work at a company in Cedar Rapids called MedTouch. I am the senior user experience architect there. Or as my husband likes to say, I'm the senior buzzword, buzzword, something, something. <laughs> That's him right there, so you can thank him later for that. Uh, so at MedTouch, I, uh, I do a lot of strategy work. Uh, I wear many hats there. I've been there for a couple of years. I do a lot of information architecture, some content strategy, some wireframing. Um, I do a lot, uh, in the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot with personalization strategies and uh, learned a lot about that in the last couple of years and I'm really excited to share what I know so far. It's constantly changing and evolving and it's very complex. So. I won't pretend to be uh, the expert in the field on this, but there are a lot of exciting things happening here. I also live in Iowa City. Is there anyone here from Iowa City? Hey, represent. OK, so um, I can walk around for this. So I'm going to tell a little story about um, we all, who doesn't use Netflix? I think that'd be, yeah. So we all know Netflix. And it's been personalizing the experience since it even did, before it did streaming video um, it did on its website. And so one thing that I noticed recently, um, and it's probably been this way for years and I just finally noticed it, is that you can, you can set your profile for each user in Netflix, which is super cool because, okay, don't tell anybody this, but um, we're sharing a Netflix account with my sister's family. Uh, so don't shh. Um, so we, <laughs> my sister's family lives in San Diego. So we've got Laura, Juan, and kids so far. But what I, I created Juan's account because Juan is a, an English as a second, second language speaker. He's Hispanic. And his first language, he learned English when he came, you know, uh, came here in the, when he was in, the, in his 20s. And so, it's always a little bit more difficult for him to follow English, especially in movies where people are speaking really quickly. And this is important because he puts the captions on all the time when he's watching Netflix. And so when we would come back onto Netflix, the captions would be on and it was kind of annoying because we don't want the captions on. So we were playing this caption battle between our two houses. So um, we'd, we'd watch Netflix, turn off the captions, then they'd watch Netflix, turn on the captions, and then we'd come back and do that over and over and over again. And it was a little bit annoying, but not annoying enough to pay an extra 10 bucks a month. <laughs> so, so what I did recently was I was thinking, well, what could we do to fix this caption battle problem? And so I said, well, I have an idea. I'll create an account. I'll create a profile for one. And when I was in there, I changed the language to Spanish just because I thought it was cool. I mean, I didn't know you could do that. So if Juan goes in and watches Netflix, he can see it in Spanish, you know, and that's probably a lot easier since he spoke that for the first 20 years of his life. And he still speaks it quite a bit now. So I thought that was really cool. I was like, hey, Juan gets his own profile and we don't have to turn the captions off anymore. So then what happened? Uh, I didn't say anything to Juan when I did this in the account. I just kind of said, I'm going to create an account for Juan, and I, and I gave him his own account. And I didn't say anything to him, and then he texted me, and he said, hey, Laura, I noticed there's a little box on Netflix with my name on it. That's really cool. Thank you. The reason I'm telling you this story is because it really highlights what about personalization is really interesting and cool for our users. So, Anybody that experiences a personalized website, they get that little extra bit of delight because it's something exactly for them uh, if it's done right. And so I think Netflix really, really does it right because he gets his very own experience, even though I'm sure they can tell that we're across the country using the same account. But even though we're paying for one account with two families, he still gets his very own experience. So 
Um, that's the moral of the story, is, is the value of personalization, is to really engage folks and, and, and make them feel like their experience is special. So, um, before I talk much longer, I wanted to just get a sense of who's in the room. Um, who has worked on a project that involved personalization before? Just a show of hands. Quite a few, okay. Who's never done a project with any personalization at all? So it's, it's pretty mixed. Um, so for folks that have done this before, um, I want to invite you. Uh, I'm going to ask questions and say, well, what do you think? What are some other things that we could consider here? I left some of it open because I wanted to generate some conversation um, because I, there are a lot of really smart people in this room. So um, please speak up if you have anything to say um, when I ask those questions uh, as we're talking. Um, it'll probably be a little more interesting if, if I'm not the only one talking this whole time too. Um, also, who works in like a consumer facing website, like business to consumer type of world? So quite a few, um, business to business, lead generation, a lot more business to business. Um, who works for a, an organization that doesn't really have like a commercial necessarily, like a nonprofit education government? Okay, and I, I think I, a lot of people are raising their hands more than once too because we work in all those spaces too, right? So today a lot of my uh, examples come from across the board, so I've got a little bit of everything. Um, one thing that, we like, that I like to do is to know what's going on in all of the industries and, and steal the best practices uh, when they make sense to my work. So today I'm going to talk about digital personalization. What is it really? Um, why should we do it? I, I kind of touched on this a little earlier. Um, and how to build an effective strategy. Um, a little hint and foreshadowing is planning is really important. And then I'm going to step through some real world examples. And when we're talking through the real world examples, I'm really interested in what you guys have to say and what your reactions are to those examples. Um, and they're not my examples for the most part. There might be one in there. So if you think that it's kind of a dumb idea or it doesn't really work, that's fine to say. Um, it's not going to hurt my feelings. Even if it is my example, I might, I might agree. So, OK. So personalization is delivering an experience that is personal, relevant, and convenient with the goal of increasing user engagement. I like this definition because it breaks it down really nicely. It makes a really complicated topic easier to understand. Um, I think the key pieces is that it's personal and it's relevant. So it matters to the person that you're, you're targeting. And also, you always have to tie it back to the goals of why are we doing this? So we want to increase the engagement of the person who is experiencing the personalization. So um, that's why I really like that definition. I tend to come back to it. There are probably a lot of definitions out there, but that's the one I, I tend to stick with. So when I was uh, prepping for this talk, I saw a lot of articles that said there are three W's to personalization. Um, who, what, and where. And I wanted to add one before that, which is why. Um, anytime we do any work, um, we want to know why, especially in inf information architecture. We need to know why are we doing this? What are the goals? Um, what do we hope to achieve when this happens? So I kind of, uh, who, what, where is pretty, when you, if you're looking at personalization on the web and, and researching it, there are a lot of folks out there that say, this is, these are the three W's. But I would say, therefore, because the why is very important. That's why I put it first. So I'll step through each one of these um, and just talk a little bit about how do we get there? How do we understand that? So when you're thinking about why are we personalizing, um, think about what value can it provide? Uh, so I've got a few ideas here. Um, brand recognition, maybe you just want to get the brand recognized, you want to increase loyalty. Um, maybe you're in the business to business world and you need to kind of generate and nurture your leads through a process. Maybe you want to just increase engagement on your site. You're being measured by how long people stick around and how many pages they view. 
maybe you're very focused on the conversion, so you need to make those sales, you need to ring the cash register and, and ring it as much as possible. I know in the, in the, you know, the e-commerce world, this is where a lot of the personalization tactics come into play because it's so competitive and everybody's trying to get more of that dollar. Um, I was just wondering if I missed anything on the slide, or you think, are there other reasons that in your own work that you've done personalization projects? In the back? To uh, <clears throat> not just increase engagement, but also to what it's called just fundamentals promote a, a, a series of actions. And that's what the lot of people think. It's not just engagement, but also to engage and promote. So right. So to kind of nurture somebody along a path right. that you want, the, or to uh, get them to take the next step when they haven't taken that step yet. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. It's, it's interesting because it actually could be a way of simplifying things because you are maybe showing content that is only relevant to them and not bombarding them with stuff that would appeal to everyone. So I found that you know, personalizing to that makes it easier to use. Yeah, that's a great point. So you can simplify and you don't have to, so you can tailor it and you don't have to put all that junk on the homepage yeah. that everybody wants. Uh-huh. Is there anyone else? Um, I've alluded to with a lot of these points, but differentiation, just the level of personalization compared to your competitors would be a key factor. Right, competitive advantage, especially in the, um, it's not just uh, commercial websites anymore that are personalizing, so as you move into the other industries, um, even if you're not selling something directly, personalization is becoming a differentiator. Okay, great. So the next question to ask yourself is who are you trying to reach? So who's your primary audience? Hopefully you're already thinking about this if you're, you're doing a web project. What does this person really want? And what is he or she trying to do on your site? Um, can anybody think of a tool that could help us figure that out? I, people are smiling, yeah. Uh, Marketo. Yeah. Yep. So we, uh, analytics, things like that. You can go into your, any data that you have. Um, one way to synthesize uh, some of that data and research that you have are, are to create personas. Um, I created this one a, real, a long time ago. Um, it's the only one I have that isn't copyrighted, actually. Um, so what you can do, um, if you haven't been creating personas a lot, or if you just want a quick and easy way to do it. You can check out some of these, make my, these tools, like HubSpot has one. You're gonna have to give up an email address, just warning you if you wanna use that one. Uh, same for Extensio, they have a, um, I'm not actually affiliated with any of these companies, so I'm not recommending or not <laughs> necessarily, but um, I like free, free trials. So if you wanted to check out any, either of those, those are free resources for creating personas to answer those questions. So a persona is basically a fictional person that helps us connect with the audience on a, a kind of an emotional level. So we, we have the picture and the story, and then we have very detailed information about their demographics, which are important for personalization. And then we have their goals, and then how does that translate to what they're doing on the website? So. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about personas because you could spend another hour on that. But um, as you're thinking about personalization, I would really encourage you to have at least one persona for your personalization plan. Another tool that you can use uh, to kind of think through who you're trying to reach and what they're trying to do is the experience map. Um, I like this mini template here that I found just because it's uh, experience maps can feel a little bit overwhelming and hard to do. This is a, a tool that you can use really quickly. It's just a piece of paper. And you think about your persona, who they are, and then the stages in their journey, or their buying process, or their, uh, where the path that, that they need to take to get from point A to B. You think about that with your persona through every stage and what they're thinking, feeling, and doing. And so all those boxes up there allow you to do that, and then at the bottom you think about, okay, what, now that I've thought about this, 
um, what are the questions, problems, concerns that come up, and what are the solutions? So that's another tool you can use to really get at the who, um, and what those two things can really help if you do that planning on the front end. Okay, so next, what are we gonna change? Um, we make changes in personalization based on what we already know about our visitor, um, either from our persona work or from the data that we continually capture while they're on our site. Uh, and then what will we change based on what we know? So those are two, two things to think about. So as you're creating your plan for your personalization, um, these are the inputs that you'll have. So I'm gonna step through um, a few things that we generally know about our visitors pretty easily. Um, we can tell where they're located in a number of ways automatically. Um, we can tell their language, the, the computer tells us their, their language that they prefer, or we can, they can tell us that as well. If they ever fill out a form on a website, we know what they filled out and we can use that data again if we have the, the back end in place for that. We can know what device they're using to access the site, or maybe not specific device necessarily, but we know their operating system and their viewport size, so we can make some good guesses. We know what they're doing on our site. So we're cooking everybody these days, and so we know that they came to this page, and then they went to that page, and then they clicked on this link. So we can use that data in our personalization. And then also we have a lot of marketing campaigns generally in our, in our work. So uh, if we have a marketing campaign, we know usually that they came into our site from that campaign or from search engine or something else. So we can know all of these things about our visitors without them telling us at all anything and we can personalize to the site that way. We can also personalize for our visitors with uh, things that they tell us on the site or selections they make as well. Um, what else can we know about our visitors that isn't on this list? Demographic. Right, their, their demographic interests because of their search history, right? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. I left it open intentionally. We can understand the type of content that they might be accessing on our site. How so? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can take the historical data on our website and, and make some pretty, pretty good uh, in inferences there as well. Anything else? Age. Age, yep. Yeah. For their, um, their demographic data and search as well. Or if they provide it to us. Right, so you'll have a, a CRM on the back end probably that you're using in conjunction with your website and you can tailor that information as well. If you layer in social, you can also um, know what groups they might be a part of or special interests, how they identify themselves. Right, that social, social media piece. Does anyone else feel like you're just feeding the beast when you go on Facebook? Yeah, so we can know a lot of things about people visiting our sites. It's really kind of scary to me, but um, we can know many things, and those are all really, really great examples of things that we can know. Now, the thing that's challenging with personalization is deciding what's important to know <laughs> and, and what we need to know to, to have a successful plan. So here is, um, I wanted to start pulling in some examples of personalization to kind of uh, illustrate some of these points. So uh, this is a VAST, it's antivirus software. And if I visit it on my Mac, I get this hero image that says, there are many reasons to protect your Mac. And it tells me that I can get it for iPhone um, and iPad and, and it's already set for me to go. So it kind of takes that first step for me, it knows I'm on a Mac, so here's the button for you, right? I don't have to find the right version of the software. Now, if I come on a, a Windows machine, 
I get a different hero. And I get information that it's Windows 10 compatible. And I get a different button and I get different software. So it's a very subtle, well, it's very simple, but it's very effective because it's taking that first step. So a personalization plan doesn't have to have 50 steps. It just has to have the right steps. So what can we change? So you saw in the previous example, we can change images, copy, call. Um, when you're going through a site, we can change the call outs or calls to action as well. We can make recommendations. If you think uh, Netflix and Amazon, they recommend other, th other things that we might like to see. We can uh, provide special offers as well. What are some other things for the folks that have worked on personalization? What are some things that you've changed? Change the price. The price? Yes. That's why we shop with the uh, incognito, right? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so navigation and everything, right? That you have a d completely different experience. Where do you, what, what site are you working on? That's really cool. Yeah, uh, it's, it was challenging for me to find good examples of personalization just browsing the web. Um, a lot of times when I was looking, I'd go look at, a, I'd look at an article and it would say, this is a really cool example of personalization and then they wouldn't be doing it anymore. It must not have worked, right? <laughs> so um, that's a really cool, did you say it was? Uh, Cooter. Cooter? Cooter, okay, great. I like those. I'm gonna I'm gonna check that out. Any any other examples of things that have changed in personalization? Okay, that's ex that's interesting too. So you take. Uh, the experience, uh, and you make it really label, label heavy probably when they first start. So you're saying, we know you're a new user, so we're gonna give you, give you more cues of how to use our, our system. And then if they come back over and over again, you kind of minimize that, clear up the clutter for them. That's a really great example. That's cool too. Yeah, there are, it's pretty ubiquitous right now. Um, so when we're doing our IA content strategy UX work, um, it's really important for us to, as we're coming up, think about how personalization can increase the value and the usability of our sites. Those are great examples. So um, I use a product called Envision, and uh, it doesn't usually look like this with blank boxes, but I grabbed a screen from my employer and I don't think they want us to show our, our work in progress at a, um, at a talk. So those would, have, those would be designs normally. Um, so the reason I wanted to show this slide was because um, I was using Envision with my team because we use it to collaborate, provide feedback. Um, we, we were using it quite heavily. We had a lot of work going on. And so what happened was I got a, a message from Adriana at uh, Envision, and she said, you're using our app like ninjas lately, so we really think you would like our enterprise solution. And I thought that was pretty clever. Um, they, they took the behavior of not just me, but the other people in my organization, and they found a way to message a very targeted, specific message to me to encourage us to take the next step. Now, I don't know if we'll get an enterprise solution, but I, if we were, considering it, that could be the thing that gets that decision made. Do you have any, any level of freak outs if they knew how much you were working on it? 
oh, maybe, but I kind of expected them to be watching everything that we were doing. <laughs> but I thought it was, um, I kind of assume that anything I put, type into a computer is being tracked and monitored and stays around forever. So um, that's kind of my operating um, assumption. So if, you, if there's something really sensitive, I'm going to write a note and burn it. <laughs> I'm not going to put it on a computer or use my cell phone or anything. OK, so you know what you're going to do. You also have to think about what channels are you going to personalize. Uh, I put email first because I think that uh, that's one of the easiest ways to personalize. There's a lot of tools and software out there that allow you to, to do that without a lot of effort. And it's actually pretty effective, too. Um, but you can use display media, SEM, campaigns to personalize. You can do that within your SEM, but you can also extend your personalization from SEM into your website or into your property. You can personalize an application. You can send text messages. Now, I was wondering, has anybody other, ever done a personalized text message or gotten one? You have? Can you talk about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or just as part of your plan or personalization plan. Well, I was working uh, with a uh, the text message provider, and we were doing uh, weather for the, that was personalized to each individual grouping. It was a kind of a test scenario. It was uh, very interesting because they could they could get comments from that and uh, commodities information as one set. So you're sending weather texts. Okay, yeah. And also, they, we also did paging as well before testing was possible. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are some folks in the room that have been doing this at least as long or if not longer than I have, and I've been around the block for a while too. So that's cool. Um, you can do it on your own website, on other people's websites if you're feeding content out, and then also blogs, social media, things like that. So I realized that we had a lot of discussion, which is great, but we're getting really close to the end of my talk, and I want to talk through some examples, too. So I'm going to start with e-commerce. This is primarily online e-commerce. Does anybody shop at ModCloth? Okay, a few, the women in the room. By the way, I'm so excited that we have such a great balance between men and women in this room, um, especially with the speakers. So go ahead and clap. Yeah, that's great. Um, as a side note, I'm in a group in Iowa City that is trying to promote women in tech um, from kids. Like it's called Iowa Tech Chicks, and we go into schools and stuff. So. I, when I feel when I come to under, when I come into a room and I see 50/50 split in a technology conference, I think that's so cool. I feel like that's um, that's amazing. Um, so mod cloth, back to mod cloth. So this is before I've uh, joined joined anything or done anything on the site. This is my first visit, so they uh, I haven't done anything yet. And then I start to browse. Now, I don't necessarily agree with the user experience of a modal pop-up, but I did include it as an example of what they're doing. So um, once I start looking at dresses, they message me with, hey, you could get some money off if you create your account now. And then, or you could join with Facebook. Then we get more of your data. So on ModCloth, we, we joke about ModCloth at work because uh, you look at something on the website. So I looked at this blazer. Wait, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. Didn't mean to go quite that fast. So they'll make recommendations for other blazers because they know I like blazers. They'll email me and encourage me to come back and look at my favorites or make more favorites. They'll follow me on Facebook and show me that blazer. <laughs> we know you really wanted this blazer. We don't understand why you didn't buy it. And if that's not enough, they'll show it to me when I'm researching for a talk and I want to look at brands. They'll show me that blazer in every single color of blazer that they can, in every spot that they can on the website. 
So that's a kind of a classic e-commerce type of example. I know why they do it. It's just kind of silly sometimes. Feels silly a little bit, but I might buy that blazer actually. <laughs> okay, so e-commerce and brick and mortar. So um, Blaine's Farm and Fleet. This was one of the ones when I was looking out, like I'm gonna talk about personalization. What are some good examples or what are some examples I could show? Uh, so this one was mentioned and it actually is still being done, so I kept it. Uh, you notice that they really want your email address, but they only show it to you on your first visit. So they're, they're giving you that kind of hard sell for sign up now, but if you, ha if you don't sign up, they're not going to keep showing it to you. They, did, they figure that if you decided not to join our email newsletter, showing this box to you 50 more times isn't going to make it happen. So I kind of like that. And then um, I was looking at the site when I was in Iowa City and Muscatine apparently was the closest farm and fleet store to me. So if I browse around and shop, I really want to dish a wash towel here. Um, so I can either have this item shipped or um, I can see that it's not stocked in Muscatine, unfortunately. However, I can also see that Davenport has the washcloth, so I can go there and get the washcloth at Davenport. So uh, the interesting thing about this example is that when you're looking at e-commerce plus brick and mortar, the location and the store finders become really important. And um, so you want to make sure that you're giving users a path to buy your product in whichever way is the most convenient for them. So I thought they did a pretty good job here. Still don't, I don't like the modal though. Um, here's another example of Home Depot, and uh, they're doing a HTML5 geolocation. So I included this one because the previous one used IP sniffing, so it knew where you were generally. Um, with HTML5 geolocation, it's a little better for mobile, so you get a little more exact data about where people are. The drawback is that you get that browser message that people can then block their location as well. So. You, uh, when you're thinking about personalization, you think about how granular do you need to be with your location, and if you need to know exactly where someone is, you might decide to do geolocation. So they're doing this at the Home Depot as well. So they're finding my stores. I can set my stores, I can change it. I can shop and see what's in the store right now. So um, if I wanna do some free shopping, shopping, I can do that here. Okay, so those are a few e-commerce examples. Now, if um, a, more of a business-to-business -business type example that I found online, um, anyway, QuickBase, I sell project management software, first visit, then I get this uh, managing projects call to action here. So uh, one strategy that tends to be used a lot with business-to-business -business is these, um, helping guide folks along the path with different kinds of features and calls to action. So um, it, here's the managing projects call to action. Oh, I don't want to read it right now. Hey, do you want to read this other one? This is about citizen development. You might be interested in that. So they give me a couple of different options of things that I can read or download. So maybe I came back later and I'm like, I remember there was a project management white paper and I, I don't have anything to do tonight, so I think I'll read that. And so I, I read that, gave them my email address, of course, to, to be able to read that white paper. So they send me an email, and they thank me for reading it. They give me the link. They suggest that I could now uh, view their webinar. And uh, I should really sign up for their email newsletter, because I think I might like it. And then I go back to their blog later. And instead of seeing the project management, management download, I see the email newsletter download. So they know, um, and the interesting thing about this was that they had my email address already filled out when I came back to the site. So really if I, if I decided I wanted to get that email, all I had to do was click the orange button. Pretty easy. I didn't sign up for the email though. Okay, entertainment. This is actually thanks to my husband's example. I'm not a sports person, but I wanted to get some other non-shopping examples. So. ESPN, if you go on their site, um, 
in Iowa City, you see that they think you should like the Hawkeyes, which in Iowa City we do like the Hawkeyes. So um, they give us some recommendations of things that we might want to follow on, on ASPN. If I come back and log in, I can set my favorites or change my favorites when I come back. And then I can see my favorite teams, which also includes Minnesota teams. So that's a, a nice way to get the content back um, in front of people. Um, for an entertainment or, or a content type website, we know that folks are interested in certain things. Let's, let's make sure that they can find those things really quickly um, right away. And maybe they'll come back to, to see that thing that they're really interested in. Okay, I do have a healthcare example because I work at a company that does digital strategy for, for uh, healthcare websites. So this, uh, this is a hospital health, health system in the uh, Chicago area. And uh, this is their homepage, and you can see that they can, they can find a location. If they decide they want to see locations nearby, they get the HTML5 browser uh, geolocation prompt. They can also see locations nearby if they end up on the find a location page on their website. And if they do, um, I had I actually spooked, so I pretended I was in Naperville when I did this. So this person's in Naperville, and they can see that their Edward Hospital main campus is the closest location. It's only like two miles away, according to, to the location I put on the website here. And then they can see, in order from closest to farthest away, the locations. So. Um, I want to talk next about some multi-channel strategies, kind of putting it all together. Um, some things that I found, um, shopping examples again, sorry. I, I don't really shop a lot, but I do browse quite a bit online. Um, and I, I do sign up for the emails uh, for, for clothing stores for some reason. I don't know. I never buy anything. But um, So here is uh, Ann Taylor Loft. And I bought something online there, or maybe in their store. Um, but it's been a while. And so they sent me an email and they said, we miss you, come back. We'll give you this great deal if you come, if you shop. So I didn't. Um, so then they sent me another email. I said, your gift is waiting. What are you waiting for? Free money, come on. So that's an example of a, um, an email strategy. It was probably automated, I'm guessing. Um, so that's if you're just doing email, um, Thinking through, you know, if they haven't been there in a while, how do you get them back? And if they don't respond, how do you get them back again? And, you know, it must work because they're doing, you know, I think a lot of uh, companies are doing this type of uh, tactic and I think it's probably pretty effective. So um, another thing that Loft did was they're trying to interest me in something and they're pulling in astrology. I don't know how they know I am interested in astrology, but maybe it's just a marketing campaign, I don't know. But um, so they, they did the styloscopes email, so they're starting to introduce this campaign for their, their uh, astrology, shop your, shop your sign. I guess if we have a different astrological sign, we may have different clothing that will be more interesting to us, apparently. So um, I saw that, and then a little bit later, um, I got an email that said, hey, cancer, horoscopes. So they personalized, they must have known the, my birthday or birth month, and then they took the horoscope for that date, and they sent me an email and said, hey, our, your horoscope is waiting on our website. You should check it out. So I did. So um, you can see here the experience um, on desktop. I actually tried it first on the phone. You can see that it didn't really work out too well on their site. Um, the reason I included this one is that um, you're gonna have at least 50%, I think. I mean, that's, I would say you're gonna have a sizable portion of your audience um, responding to your personalization and your website on a, on a small device. And it's just gonna continue to grow. So if you're spending time and money thinking about personalization, uh, it's really important to make sure that it does work on a mobile device because that's a lost opportunity there. Um, but their desktop site looked really good too, you know. So Sephora, um, 
I talk about Sephora a lot, so you guys haven't heard it before, so you're fresh. Um, but I was at the store the other day and they were doing a, a lip color promotion. And um, so this is a screen, this is just a snap of the big poster they had in the store promoting the virtual artist. Um, I also received email about this campaign. Um, sure, it's on their website, and they have a standalone app in both Android and iOS just for this campaign on lip color. So here's the email. So this is just a general email that I got, and then if you go down, it's this area down here, and they're promoting their virtual artist, getting you to uh, try it. So if you go to their virtual artist website, you can upload a photo. This is the fun part. And do some work to make sure it covers your lips right. And then you can try out all the different lipsticks. You can see how much it costs, what color it is, and what it would look like. So I thought that was a really interesting example of where personalization is going. Um, it's moving beyond um, just uh, nurturing people along a path of everything is becoming personalized. Um, so things, there are services like Stitch Fix that they choose things for you, they get your interests, and then they start sending you clothes. So personalization is moving beyond the digital experience, but it's working together between online and offline worlds, really, in, in interesting ways. So they also have a responsive website, works pretty well. I couldn't get the lips quite right on this one, but it was good enough. And they have an app as well, which was actually the first place I went because that's what they were promoting, but it didn't work. So I was pretty frustrated because I was pretty excited to try this virtual lip artist. <laughs> it was, you know, I don't know, I was like gonna be in the car, you know, and. My husband always drives, so you gotta have something to do. I'm a horrible, horrible wife, by the way. He's, he's uh, very patient with me. Um, so I was pretty, pretty bummed that it didn't work. And if I hadn't been giving this talk, I wouldn't have tried it again. I mean, I didn't really care that much about trying on different lipsticks on my phone, but um, I was gonna do it if I was sitting in the car for an hour. So um, again, if you're gonna offer an app, make sure it works because it's, it's a really missed opportunity and it actually makes people kind of disappointed because I mean, here they're like, it doesn't work, uh, you know? And they're giving it four stars so pe other people will see that this doesn't actually work. And they're really upset about it. I mean, because I was upset. I was like, dang, I have to talk to, talk to people now. I can't just look at my phone. All right, to wrap up, um, tips for a successful strategy, kind of encapsulating everything that I've been talking about. Um, know your four W's, why, who, what, and where. So really write that down, make a plan, do a lot of thinking, thought work ahead of time. It's uh, any time that I've tried to work, do a strategy and there hasn't been that thought work, uh, something always tends to go wrong, you know, that we didn't think, oh yeah, we didn't think of that we didn't spend enough time planning. Um, so that's really important. Have a plan, and I would really encourage you, if you're new to it, um, or even if you're not new, start simple, because it gets really complicated really quickly. If you think about your personalizing an experience, and let's say you're personalizing content, and you have 26 different locations with different messages, and you're gonna personalize for a location throughout the site 26 different ways and you have a thousand pages of content on your site. Oh my goodness, that's a headache. So um, if you want to do that and there's a good reason to do it, then yes, do it. Um, but be aware how quickly that can get out of control. So start simple, make sure you have a great plan and understand it before any code's built, any designs are done, if you can. I know we like to be agile, so sometimes we like to throw stuff on the wall and, and try it out, so there's, we can definitely do visual concepting, but before we start too far down the road with builds, we wanna make sure our plan's pretty solid. And then I think 
in every industry, we want to measure results and show the value. Because um, if we can't tell if the plan had any effect, why do we even do it? <laughs> you know, so we want to be able to show folks that because we did A, we had this many more sales, we had this many more leads, we have this many more visitors using our site for this much longer, visiting this, these other pages. I mean, so just always measure and, and then you can also improve based on your measurement because I've never worked on a project where everything went perfectly the first time around. Has anyone ever done, had that experience? Because if you have, I want to talk to you later. You have, okay, well, I'll be finding you later. <laughs> so, but you can, <laughs> once, okay, so once it happened, yeah. I don't think it ever has for me. So, um, thank you so much for listening and chatting with me today. Um, I know we uh, probably don't have time for questions, so, um, but if you do have questions later or want to chat about personalization or share your experiences with me, I'd love to hear what you're doing too. So thank you so much, everyone.